This presentation is sponsored by the Diversity Initiative Grant and by the Infotech program. Um, thank you for coming. We appreciate you showing up. Today we have Dr. Jesse Stommel. Um, he's over there on the laptop and he's also up on the screen. He's an assistant professor of digital humanities at University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, he is also the founder, director, and CEO of Hybrid Pedagogy. Um, it's an online peer-reviewed scholarly publication. And today's presentation is about promoting social justice in scholarly journals. And just as a point of transparency, um, I've had one piece published at Hybrid Pedagogy, I believe Mary has as well, and several of our grad students have also been published, um, either current grad students or they recently graduated at Hybrid Pedagogy as well. So there's kind of a loose relationship with our program and some of our people in hybrid pedagogy, whether or not Jesse was aware of it. So anyways, thank you, Jesse. And so before I start, I just want to say that I'm going to pop some slides up here. So you're going to stop seeing my living room for a little bit. But before I pop those up, I want to just start by inviting you to interrupt me at any point. Um, you might have to you might have to holler out if you decide to if you decide to interrupt me so that I can hear you, but also I can see you. So if you raise your hand, I'll, I'll stop and pull my slides off the screen and put my face back up there. My hope is that we've got a pretty small group here that we can have a conversation as much as possible. I've got some stuff I want to talk about, but I'm going to try and move through it relatively quickly, hopefully with some interruptions from you, and um, then we can have a conversation for the last um, 20, 30 minutes um, or however much time we have until we all grow bored of each other's company, I suppose. Um, so the, what I'm going to talk to you about today is I'm going to talk to you about, the title of my talk is Promoting Social Justice in Scholarly Journals. Um, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about scholarly publishing, although in doing so I think I'm going to be pushing on that word scholarship, what the word scholarship means. Um, and so that's something that hopefully we can have a discussion about. What does is what I'm describing to you today even something that we want to hold on to that word scholarship to describe? So let me go ahead and pull up my slides and um, start chatting with you. So again, um, Jesse Stommel um, on Twitter, my alias on Twitter is at Jessifer. And one thing, I always put this up on my slides because I sort of feel like what we do in a room like this, the conversation we have here is only really valuable if we're able to continue it afterwards. So feel free to reach out to me there. You can throw questions at me during this presentation, but you're also welcome to throw questions at me at any point after today by just um, at mentioning me on Twitter. And if you're not on Twitter, feel free to send me an email. I'm also on Facebook. I'll, you know, happy to chat with you anywhere. What you're looking at right here is this is a Wordle. Um, it's a word cloud of every word that was published in the first two years, um, or the most common words that were published during the first two years of hybrid pedagogy, which is the journal that I run and something I'm gonna be talking to you a little bit about today. One of the things when I did this is it forced me to really think about what we had done and what we had accomplished over our first year, two years. We've now been running the journal. It's, it launched in, it officially launched to the public in January of 2012. And so we've been running for a little over three and a half years. This was the first two years. Uh, after two years, we had published, I think, 175 articles from uh, 175 articles from, I think, 90 authors at that point um, that this is representing. So every word that had been published up to that point. I love here that the word students looms largest. That's something really important to me and something that was really important from the launch of the journal. This idea that this wasn't just a space for teachers to talk about teaching. It was a space that we were essentially wanting to bring students into the conversation. We've ex we succeeded at that to various degrees, but certainly students learning, these are what the journal is about. One thing that I also thought was pretty interesting the other day, I did a Google search for the phrase, listening to students. And I was pretty excited to see that um, hybrid pedagogy was the first search result when I typed in listening to students on a Google search. So here's a quote from Howard Rheingold. And I want to start with this quote from Howard 
because I think it's important as we go into a conversation, which is going to, there's some skepticism that I'm going to be sharing with you today. And I think that this piece is valuable because it allows us to recognize that when we're talking about skepticism, when we're talking about social justice, when we're talking about um, publishing as a sort of activism or publishing as a sort of pedagogy, and when we're talking about technology and how technology is transforming education, I don't think that the response to that is to run from the room, to run screaming from the room. I'm hoping that none of you during my presentation today run screaming from the room. But here Howard writes, it is possible to think critically about technology with route without running off to the woods. Although I must warn you, it is possible that you will never be quite so comfortable again about the moral dimensions of progress and the part we all play in it. I know that I'm not. I've also said elsewhere that I think this work, this work of thinking about higher education, this work of thinking about teaching and learning, thinking about pedagogy, thinking about the shape of scholarly publishing, this work is really not about drinking the Kool-Aid. It's not about dumping the Kool-Aid out. What it's actually about is putting the Kool-Aid under a microscope. So I hope that that's what my talk today is going to be. It's going to be a chance for us to put the Kool-Aid under the microscope a little bit. So Paulo Freire, I love having Paulo Freire and um, Howard Rheingold up next to each other in this slide because, in these two slides, because there's a way in which for me they're thinking about a lot of the same subjects from two very different vantage points, two very different perspectives on education, on learning, um, and even on technology and learning, the tools that we use for learning. Paulo Freire writes, there is no such thing as a neutral educational process. Everything that we do in higher education has a political and a sort of social ramif set of ramifications. So these are some um, provocations, I guess, from me. The, pro the project of education has been misdirected. Educators and students alike have found themselves more and more flummoxed by a system that values assessment over engagement, learning management over discovery, content over community, outcomes <laughs> over epiphanies. Education has been misrepresented, um, has misrepresented itself as objective, quantifiable, apolitical. I think this is also something that as I move towards talking more and more about scholarly writing and scholarly publishing, I think that it's, it, it's really important to think about the ways that um, academia, scho the scholarly publishing industry, teaching and learning, the science of teaching and learning, the way that these position themselves as objective, quantifiable, and apolitical. And I'm going to make an argument today, I'm going to make an argument that in fact these things are deeply subjective and that there's value in keeping them deeply subjective. There's value in keeping the humane in the humanities. There's value in keeping the humane inside of the work that we do in academia. Um, education. Another provocation for me, from me, education is too often engaged in teaching that is not pedagogical. There are a whole host of other words to describe this work. Instruction, classroom management, training, outcomes driven, standards based, content delivery. What I'm going to be talking about today is I'm going to be talking about a pedagogical approach to publishing, a pedagogical work uh, approach to the work that we do in sharing our writing in higher education and academia. And I want to move away in both my thinking about pedagogy and my thinking about teaching and learning from this notion of content delivery. Um, I also want to move away from this notion of content delivery and my thinking about publishing and thinking about what shape publishing takes in higher education. In both, I want to move toward, towards this idea that pedagogy is about creating conversations, that academic publishing is about creating conversations. Higher education teaching is particularly uncritical and under-theorized. Most college educators at both traditional and non-traditional institutions do little direct pedagogical work to prepare themselves as teachers. Um, I often find myself saying some variation of this, and I'm often saying it to a room full of people like you, and there's a sense in which I'm guessing that I'm preaching to the choir. I'm guessing that you in this room are deeply interested in teaching and learning and deeply interested in pedagogy. I think what I'm pointing here is I'm pointing to the ways in which our the system of higher education doesn't always encourage that work and doesn't always champion that work in the way that I would like to see it do more of. 
Um, for example, in my graduate degree, I took 16 graduate courses. Um, only two of those were courses in, uh, or three of those were courses in pedagogy. Um, directly. I did a lot of my work um, in the humanities, and I did my work specifically in pedagogy within the humanities, but none of these courses that I took, these three pedagogy-specific intensive courses, were required of me to get my degree. Instead, I could have taken 16 graduate courses, graduated with a PhD in English, and never have taken a PhD uh, or a pedagogy course. A commitment to teaching often goes unrewarded, and pedagogical writing in most fields is not counted as, as research. I often, I often encounter this myself. My, all of my writing at this point, 95% of it is about pedagogy, about teaching and learning, and I often get push, receive pushback and am pushed to think about, well, what's the content area? What's the content area of my research? Well, the content area of my research is pedagogy in the humanities, and that itself is a content area for me. Um, so now I'm gonna just move, uh, move and talk a little bit just about what I mean. Let's put some terms on the ground. I wanna talk about what I mean when I say the word pedagogy, and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about what I mean when I say the word critical pedagogy, and then what I mean when I say the phrase critical digital pedagogy, which is the focus of the hybrid pedagogy journal. So my definition of pedagogy is that pedagogy is praxis. Pedagogy is the place where philosophy and practice meet. Uh, it's essentially both doing the work of teaching and learning, and then also simultaneously reflecting on the work of teaching and learning. For me, my pedagogy is about doing, putting those two activities as close together as possible. So it's not that we have an experience of teaching and learning, and then a year later we write a paper and publish a paper reflecting on that experience of teaching and learning, but, this is a, but that this is a recursive process, that it's constantly happening, that we're constantly moving back and forth between the act of teaching and learning and the reflection upon the act of teaching and learning. The two feed one another. So critical pedagogy. Critical pedagogy is an approach to teaching and learning predicated on fostering agency and empowering learners, implicitly and explicitly critiquing oppressive power structures. The critical and critical pedagogy functions in several registers. So often we see capital C, capital P, critical pedagogy to um, essentially outline a school of thought advanced by Frere and, uh, and various different people that were in conversation with Paulo Frere. I want to push on that a little bit and think about, well, what is the word critical doing in that phrase, critical pedagogy? Critical as in mission critical, essential. Critical as in literary criticism and critique, providing definitions and interpretations. Critical as in a reflective and nuanced approach to a thing. Critical as in criticizing institutional or corporate impediments to learning. And capital C, capital P, critical pedagogy as a disciplinary approach which inflects and is inflected by each of these other me uh, meanings. I think the one here that gets lost and that's important to us today in this particular talk is number four, critical as in criticizing institutional or corporate impediments to learning. Here we're talking about social justice. Um, and, and that's a component of this piece. And I think it's really important to remember that for Paulo Freire, for the movement of critical, capital C, capital P, critical pedagogy, this number four was very important, that this was political activist work. Um, and now I'm gonna talk a bit about what critical digital pedagogy would be. But before I do that, can I, I'm just gonna pause and see if there are any questions about critical pedagogy or any questions about anything I've said thus far. Now I need a Jeopardy theme. Who wants to put the Jeopardy theme no. going on in the background? Are you, are you all good? Looks like we're good. OK, cool. So I'm going to move on. Critical digital pedagogy. Um, essentially, what happens if we take critical pedagogy and mash it up with our thinking about uh, teaching with technology, thinking about how we use technology for both teaching and learning? And so here I've begun to outline a definition for what I call critical digital pedagogy. One, it centers practice on community and collaboration. Two, it must remain open to diverse international voices and thus requires invention to reimagine the ways that communication and collaboration happen across cultural and political boundaries. Three, critical digital pedagogy will not, cannot be defined by a single voice, but must gather together a cacophony of voices. 
And this why is why I think it's so important that every time I talk about critical digital pedagogy and talk about the ways that critical digital pedagogy have influenced my approach to publishing and my approach to academic research, that I really pause on this number three and realize that it can't just be me up on a screen delivering the wisdom uh, you know, the, of my last three and a half years of working on hybrid pedagogy, but that it has to be a conversation. And so hopefully, you know, hence why I would like us to spend at least a good, a good amount of time at the end having a, having a good dialogue. Um, number four, must have use and application outside traditional institutions of education. And this is where my work on pedagogy really intersects with my work in the public humanities. That essentially when we're talking about academia, when we're talking about scholarly publishing, but when we're talking about um, pedagogy within institutions of higher education, I want us to always be thinking about where is the boundary between what we do at institutions of higher education and what we're doing in the rest of the world, and what people in the rest of the world who might not have access to higher education are doing, and how can we put this work in conversation? How can we make sure that we're not having uh, conversations in rooms, probably like this one, where everyone is an administrator, a teacher, a student, um, rather than thinking about how those conversations intersect with the work that we do with our communities, our broader communities, be it the local community in which we live or the global, the sort of global digital community that, you know, that, you know, when I'm on Twitter, I'm engaging primarily with teachers and students, other teachers and students, but there's a way in which I'm putting my work into a much larger sphere where uh, it has the potential to intersect with and interact with a much broader group of people. So, and I think this today is my thesis. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll throw that out there and um, possibly later I'll say, no, 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 wait, wait, stop. This is actually my thesis. Um, but I think for today, this is my thesis. The teaching is deeply personal and political work through which pedagogues cannot and do not remain objective. Rather, pedagogy, and particularly critical pedagogy, is work to which we must bring our full selves and work to which every learner must come with full agency. The interesting thing is that this is where I started. This is the topic that I wanted to create a scholarly journal around. And what I realized was as I started to formulate this project back in um, 2011, and it really I was thinking about it well before that, but as I started to really put it together in 2011 for the launch in 2012, I realized that I couldn't just launch a scholarly journal and have that journal not be informed, have every part of the practice of that journal not be informed by the research that I did the research that I do personally and by the topics that the journal would focus on. So it's this bit about it being deeply personal work, that this work is subjective. We want to imagine that double-blind peer review can make the publishing, the academic publishing industry um, objective. Um, and I think what that is, is it's a, it's a sort of false um, hope. It's a false hope that we can ever have some sort of neat and tidy objectivity. But instead, what we need to do is we need to think about who are the actual, actual humans that we're working with? Who are the humans we're writing about? Who are the humans we're collaborating with? Who are the student humans that we're teaching? And also, who are the humans that are the audience for this work that we're doing? And how can we think, sort of bring that humanness to the fore? So in Pedagogy of the Oppressed, Paulo Freire argues against the banking model in which education becomes an act of depositing, in which the students are the depositories and the teacher is the depositor. I would argue that the same thing is true about the work that sort of research that we do, that often we think about our research as something that we disseminate, something that we, um, that we publish in order to have it read by other people in our field, by a larger community, but not necessarily something that starts a conversation or something that becomes a collaboration. So essentially the first question I had when I launched this journal, Hybrid Pedagogy, was how can I make the work of this journal model and mimic the work that I do in my classroom in building a student-centered, peer-driven learning environment? So in order to make academic space more humane, we need to wear our pedagogies in all the spaces in which we work. In our classrooms, administrating our institutions, editing scholarly journals, on tenure and promotion committees, and in our collaborations with faculty colleagues, staff colleagues, adjunct colleagues, and student colleagues. 
And I, a, a bit later, I'll talk about some of the specific topics and calls for papers that we've done through hybrid pedagogy that will explain sort of how we've attempted to reach out with and create collaborations with these different groups. Dan Cohen writes in um, The Social Contract of Scholarly Publishing, he writes, the social contract of the book is profoundly entrenched and powerful, almost mythological, especially in the humanities. I think that this is true in all disciplines to some extent, and I think it's also true of the journal publishing industry, that, that this sort of journal has a mystique, a capital J journal, as there's something special that a journal is doing that a blog isn't doing, something special that an academic publication is doing that's not happening on Twitter. We see this, we see the publishing, the work that academics, the work that students, the work that teachers are doing cut up into neat and tidy boxes. We have the work that's published on Slate Magazine by, by teachers or about teaching. We have work that's published in the Chronicle of Higher Education. We have work that's done on Twitter. We have also that sort of almost too neat and tidy distinction between what you can find in a Google search and what you can find in a Google Scholar search. Essentially that there's a neat dividing line between the two where you have the kind of mythological monograph and academic journal and then you have everything else. This is one of my longest time mentors, Mar uh, Marty Beckman, who writes in Returning to Community and Praxis. He was one of the first, um, first teachers I had in undergrad, one of the first teachers I had in grad school, and has continued to sort of, his wisdom has continued to kind of motivate me to this day, but not motivate me in the sense that, um, that I've sort of taken this as a, as a prescriptive, but that I continue to wonder at all of these things that he said to me. And here's an example. He wrote, he wrote, the problem is writing articles instead of making sure the articles actually change the world. And I think that this is really important for us to think about when we think about scholarly publishing, especially when we think about, I, I read somewhere recently, and I don't have the data to pull up in a slide, um, but I read somewhere recently that the average number of readers for an academic academic paper is zero. Um, and essentially that it's zero point something, you know, 0 0.8 or 0 0.7, I can't pull the statistic up. And I've seen different statistics, but all of the statistics I see rotate around the idea that the average number of citations for an article is, is something like 0 0.7, the average numbers of readers is 0 point something else. And so at that point, why are we laboring in the way that we're laboring? If our work actually isn't going to change the world, it's not just readership that we're that we're seeking out when we do this work. But there's a way in which you can't a work a work of writing can't do anything if it doesn't at least have a certain number of readers that's more than zero. So public digital scholarship. Um, this is Henry Giroux. He writes, intellectuals have a responsibility to analyze how language, information, and meaning work to organize, legitimate, and circulate values, structure reality, and offer up particular notions of agency and identity. This for me is what, why we do the work that we do, why we do work as scholars, why we do work as teachers, why we do work in, in education broadly. Um, he expands that a little bit to say that for public intellectuals, the latter challenge demands a new kind of literacy and critical understanding with respect to the emergence of the new media and electronic technologies and the new and powerful role they play as instruments of public pedagogy. It's a bit of a mouthful. We could probably spend the rest of the, the, rest of the session just piecing through all of the nuances of, yes, go for it. I was wondering if you could define um, a little bit more about what you see as a public intellectual, because there's a variety of different definitions out there. So I'd be curious as to what your approach was, as say with Edward Said versus um, her last name is Hill versus Gramsci. I mean, what's your approach yeah. on, on what public intellectuals should be doing? Well, I think that the interesting thing about that is that there's two words there, two really complicated words. One is the word public. And what do we mean when we say the word public? And then the other is the word intellectual. So maybe I'll say a bit about each. Um, and I'll start with that word public, that the word public is a complicated word because often when you think about what a public is, many different kinds of publics emerge. 
Um, and if we think about public in the digital sphere, I can think of the public that I interact with on Twitter as being very different from the public that I might engage when I write an article from the, for the Chronicle of Higher Education, being very different from the public that I engage when I give a so-called public talk at my institution, um, that each of these publics has a slightly different quality or character to it. So it's not as simple as just saying public into, that there's only one public that a public intellectual might engage with. On the other hand, someone once, I once talked about the public humanities and about work in the public humanities, and someone said to me, well, what public, um, what public do you mean? And I said, because there's this sort of a, a tension between using the word public and using the plural, the word publics. Um, and which, uh, which public do you mean? And my response was to say, I think I mean the public that doesn't recognize the existence of multiple publics. So there's a way in which can we talk about the, the public as a thing that isn't a specific set of people, but the public as a, a, a sort of a set of people that are engaging in a different way with the work that we're doing. Um, I think often when I use the word public or when I see the word public used, it's used in, um, in uh, tension with the word academic. So you have academic work and public work as two separate things. I think good academic work is necessarily at the intersection between what we do at institutions and what we do in the public, uh, what we do in, a, in, in the so-called public sphere. Um, so there's a little bit of ruminating on the word public. Let me talk a little bit about the word intellectual. That's a, that's a fascinating word. And I actually ha had a conversation with someone where they talked about the idea that you had to be an intellectual first before you could be a public intellectual, that you can't, that essentially you have to get your intellect refined to a certain point before you can take it out and deliver intellectual wisdom to the public. And I really pushed back on this notion that that, uh, that, that notion, because for me, a public intellectual is someone that is coming to know and also coming to realize that they don't know in public. So in, in dialogue, in conversation. So I guess a public intellectual is not just someone who delivers wisdom to a public audience, but that a public intellectual is also someone who is essentially developing their intellect in conversation with the public. Um, so there's, my, there, there's kind of an answer. Um, other thoughts or other questions from other people to push on this idea a little more? So, or maybe a thumbs up from, from Gregory that I, I, that I what, sufficiently answered that. What, what I was, so instead of it being an, some place where you develop and you train and then you go out and perform in the public as a spectacle, which is you go to uni, you get your training, then you show up and you're like, here, I'm, I'm here to deliver my wisdom in my whatever format. What you're indicating or what I'm drawing from your indication is that it's the very process of becoming an intellectual within a public space yeah. th that is important or that's what you're emphasizing. Yeah, and it okay. has to go both ways. It's not just delivering wisdom to the public, but also accepting that the public is full of wisdom and that yeah. the public is full of intellect that would influence the work that we might do in an academic space, that would you know, essentially influence my own intellect. I am, I am nobody if I'm not engaged in dialogue with other with other intellects and there is no wisdom that I have in my brain that I can merely deliver it only becomes wisdom at the point that it is in conversation with some someone else so essentially from from what I'm getting so far the highest most valuable piece of what you do and how you're conducting your practice is the conversation and yeah. the capacity to engage in conversation and to listen and express and not just one or the other. Is yeah, that, and, hopefully, and hopefully I'll push on that a little bit more with the specific examples of the okay. journal um, in, in mere minutes. So I'm gonna pull a slide back up. So the next one here, and I, I'll see if this is actually a tangent or if it gets us back on track or maybe continues this conversation, but this is Kathleen Fitzpatrick in a book called Planned Obsolescence. And I think it does. I actually think it intersects with this. She writes, I am not suggesting that the future survival of the academy requires us to put academic publishing safely in its grave, but I do want to indicate that certain aspects of the academic publishing process 
are neither quite as alive as we'd like them to be, nor quite as dead as might be most convenient. It's thus important for us to consider the work that the book is and isn't doing for us. I love the way that she actually, I do a little bit of work on zombies on the side. You know, my, my, um, my side job is to be a, a zombie scholar, I guess, an expert in zombies, uh, but uh, a quote unquote expert in zombies. But I think so there's a bit of that going on here, but there's a really nice, I, this, this nice idea that, um, that you don't have to throw out the baby with the bathwater. There is something that academic publishing has done well that we don't just have to put it in its grave and replace it with something else. But then in a sense, we have to, this is, gets back to this idea of put the Kool-Aid under a microscope. That it's not that we're just going to disrupt traditional academic publishing with something else. The digital is going to swoop in and say, now we're going to do it all differently. But instead, we're going to take the entire academic publishing industry and put it under, under a microscope. And what some of these new move, moves and new technologies allow us to do is they open up this moment, this moment where we're forced to ask some very um, some very important questions, and not even necessarily new questions. I think about the way that Herman Melville or Emerson or Thoreau or you know uh, Mary Shelley, the way that any of these people were thinking about knowledge creation, knowledge formation, and thinking about it specifically in relationship to technological transformation. And there's not there's not a whole new set of questions that I'm going to ask that Mary Shelley wasn't already asking in Frankenstein. But still important to take these moments, take these opportunities to circle back around. Um, there's a bit that I want to add to that. I think this goes back to uh, Gregory's question that making scholarly work legible to the public and helping it find an audience is a form of outreach, community building, and advocacy. But doing public work is not just about making academic work public. So it's not just about finding new ways to spread our work. It's not finding new ways and new audience to publish our work to, to disseminate our work to. It's not about content delivering. It's about the word share in a much more open sense that when we share our work, it means both giving our work freely to others, but it also means allowing our work to develop within that public sphere, allowing essentially our work to be influenced by other voices, allowing other voices that might not ordinarily have access to higher education or to the traditional publishing industry within higher education, allowing them to kind of inhabit our work, to live inside of our work in meaningful ways. Um, Chris Long, he writes, uh, to be published or to be read, that is the question scholars increasingly face. Although publications with reputable university presses or journals continue to be the cornerstone of the tenure and promotion process, many remain inaccessible to a broad audience. Bound up as they often are in paper volumes or locked behind paywalls required by the outmoded business practices of scholarly publishers. So this to me is suggesting that the first step is increasing access. Uh, the first step is making our work available to more people. It's basically can we open up the room to a much broader um, group of participants. Um, that to me is the first step. The second step has to be how do we engage those people once we get them in the room. Like with good pedagogy, we don't just engage them with a, a peer lecture. We engage them in conversation. We engage them in critical work and critical thinking of their own. So I'm going to use that as a segue to talk a little bit about what I've decided to do with hybrid pedagogy and some of the things that we're focused on. And I'll probably get into our process a little bit because I think some examples within our process will help elucidate this idea. Well, how do you actually do that? How do you actually bring an audience into conversation with the work? And so here's the, the slogan or the tagline of the journal, which is all learning is necessarily hybrid. Essentially, my question at the start of this was to what extent is thinking about technology important in important in some way to all pedagogy? Essentially the idea that a, a, a digital pedagogy in my brain is not only knowing when we need technological tools, but also when we need to put them down. And I think the same is true when we think about publishing. Not only do we need to think about how can technological tools help us change the shape of um, 
publishing in positive ways, but also when do we want to put our uh, technological tools down? When are they not helping us? And how can we critically evaluate that? So hybrid pedagogy is an open access journal that is not ideologically neutral, that connects discussions of critical digital pedagogy, uh, critical pedagogy, digital pedagogy, and online pedagogy, brings higher education K through 12 teachers into conversation with the e-learning and open education communities, considers our personal and professional hybridity, disrupts distinctions between students, teachers, and learners, and explores the relationship between pedagogy and scholar scholarship. And I'm gonna stop there because I'm rattling off all of these nouns and adjectives. And at the end of this list of nouns and adjectives, you think, well, who is hybrid pedagogy not for? Didn't you just list every single human being in existence? Um, well, it's not for my dog. I didn't put that it's for canines, although you know, if my dog wants to read hybrid pedagogy, I shall find a way for her. But the idea was that I saw all of these conversations happening in separate rooms. And often those conversations were, often the people in the room talking about online learning and the people in the room talking about digital humanities were having a lot of the same conversations. And I essentially wanted to create a space. How do I create a space where we can bring those conversations into the same room? Invested in this idea of uh, social, social justice, how does, um, the work of teaching and learning and the work of scholarly publish engage with a notion of social justice. Um, so the last bits here are kind of restatements of my definition of critical digital pedagogy, but hybrid pedagogy is interested in inviting its audience to participate in and be an integral part of the peer review process and thus interrogates and makes transparent academic publishing pra practices. One thing I did with hybrid pedagogy is I essentially made it go live before it had become what I imagined it might become. The idea being that I didn't want to determine the shape of the journal on my own and then deliver it and then sort of premiere it or announce it. Instead, what I did was from the very start of the journal, I started publishing on a website, hybridpedagogy.com, and I started to bring people into the conversation about what the journal might end up being. When we launched the journal, we did not have a peer review process. When we launched the journal, we did not have this neat and tidy list of exactly what the mission of the journal was. Um, instead, when we launched the journal, we also didn't have a review board. We didn't have an editorial board. We essentially had me and a collaborator launching this thing, opening it up to the web, and having a conversation about what it might be and what it might become. And that was really important to me, and that's often what I do in my pedagogy. I have a syllabus, and I give the students the syllabus on the first day, but often the syllabus is has key and important gaps in it that I want my students to help me fill. Um, I've actually also had classes where I have students write the syllabus from scratch. Um, this wasn't necessarily that. In most of my classes, I don't have my students do that. Instead, I put in key gaps that I ask for help in filling. So that essentially, there's, a, there's kind of a framework that I'm establishing, but what happens in that framework is not determined in advance. Um, so we are a group of mostly humanists, and really this was a sort of idea. It's not a humanities journal. It's not about the humanities. It's not about the digital humanities. But most of the people working on this journal are humanists, um, not exclusively, and that has kind of grown and changed over its um, evolution. But it was essentially this idea is how can we bring some of the humanities tools into play in the formation of this journal. So we run a peer-reviewed digital journal as part of a project that stretches well beyond the digital humanities into educational technology, composition studies, labor advocacy, and critical pedagogy. Our goals, interrogate academic publishing, share models that can be duplicated, offer scholars strategies for making their pedagogical, editorial, and outreach work legible as scholarship, reveal publishing as overtly pedagogical, and make pedagogy more public and open dialogue, not a monologue. Um, I'm gonna pause there and see if there are any questions. Um, and then I'm gonna sort of be moving into some more specific examples of a couple aspects of our process that'll kind of help elucidate. Uh, any questions or thoughts? Um, so I'm gonna repeat the question just for the sake of the taping. Um, Gregory asked me to do that. So I think the question is, how do you make scholarly work uh, legible to a public audience? Is that, is that a good restatement? Well, I'm wondering what your own goals are. 
Okay. Um, well, two things. I'll, I'll talk about my, my goal, why I want to do that, and I'll also talk about um, some of the things that we've done to do that. But feel free to interrupt me if I'm not going in a direction that is useful or um, helpful to you. But for me, the, the sort of the goal, the reason for doing that is because if I think about pedagogy, for example, if I think about my reflections on being a teacher, I don't want those reflections on being a teacher to exclude my student, that my students from that conversation, to exclude the student voices from that conversation. So in a sense, when I do my pedagogy, my pedagogy has to be done in conversation with the students that are involved and engaged and affected and influenced by my pedagogy. So I think the same thing for scholarly writing. I don't think we should just do scholarly writing um, as something that we deliver to only other academics. Oftentimes scholarship ends up influencing culture in very important ways. So why not have all of the, I'm gonna use the word stakeholders to, uh, for lack of a better term, I don't necessarily love that word because of its sort of corporate um, implications, but I'm gonna use the word stakeholders. Why not have all the stakeholders involved right in the process from the, from the get-go? People often talk about the work of translation that essentially we do scholarly work and that someone like, uh, for example, a reporter or someone who works for the Chronicle of Higher Ed or someone who works for the New York Times or the New Yorker, that their job is to come in and translate our work for a public audience, to make it legible to the public audience. And I think that that's useful work, but I also think that it shouldn't, I, I don't necessarily think that that relieves us of the responsibility of doing some of that work ourselves as academic and scholars especially if we're writing about something like pedagogy. To have pedagogy, to have pedagogical writing be completely illegible to students and learners, and especially when we're talking about non-traditional students and learners a lot on our journal, and sometimes people who are seeking education not for credit, um, to have the work that we're doing not be legible to the people most influenced and affected by that work seems to me like an, I, I'm gonna use the word injustice, um, and I don't necessarily mean to throw every journal that does that under the bus when I say that, but essentially I do mean to say every journal who does that should at least inquire and look and reflect on their own process and think about the ways they are doing that and when they might not do that and what the impact of doing that is. Does that answer your question? Yeah, why? Generally, it's a challenge to actually make it manifest on the pages of the journal because it's extremely hard work to do. As a writer myself and as an editor, it's, it's some of the hardest writing when you're essentially, what you're trying to do is you're, ha you're trying to have a single piece of scholarship be both legible to an academic community and also simultaneously legible to uh, a public audience, to the audience that is affected or influenced by that academic scholarship. And the thing is, sometimes those two registers are, are pretty far from one another. So finding a space in the middle where the work actually functions at both levels is extremely hard. And also finding writers who can do that successfully. There's, it, and also helping nurture writers so that they can do that successfully. To me, that's one of the missions of hybrid pedagogy. It's not necessarily, we're, you know, uh, we're, most of us are writing teachers. Um, and so in fact, what we end up doing is not just being gatekeepers, we end up being editors in the much more sort of um, collaborative sense of the word editor. We end up being people who are invested in fostering the growth of our writers. And one of the bits that I'll talk about in relation to that, that I often talk to my editors who work with me, and I say that when I'm looking at a piece and when I'm deciding if a piece is going to get published on the journal, and I don't make all of this decision solely, but when I'm looking at it and thinking about whether a piece should be published, I'm looking at it and thinking not necessarily just about what that piece will become, like what that piece will be after the months that are spent working on it, and it's published, but also thinking about what might the third piece by that writer look like. And so in a sense, it's, uh, you know, I'm willing to publish things on the journal and I'm glad to have things on the journal that I don't necessarily think 
are exactly right or exactly at the point that they need to be if I feel like I'm invested in that writer's development over time. And I think often we look at a journal, you know, traditional academic publishing, we look at a journal and if it's publishing the same writers again and again and again, there's almost this sense in which there's a suspicion. Like, gosh, why are they publishing the same person over and over again? But to me, there are real reasons why it would be pedagogically and scholarly, val scholarly, <laughs> scholarly, this, uh, scholarly there, there would be scholarly value in publishing the same author more than one time, maybe not 35 times, but publishing the same author multiple times because it, essentially they create a relationship, an organic relationship, not only with the journal, but also with the journal's audience. And their writing grows over time to more successfully um, engage with and reach that audience. Well, and if I, a lot of my background is in multimodal composition. So some of the things I'm often thinking about is not just what are the words on the page, but how are those words situated on the page? Are there images on the page? Is there a converse? Is there a, is there an opportunity to comment on the page? And so when I think about the traditional journal, um, uh, you know, a traditional journal usually doesn't have a comment section where you can freely have a discussion just below the article. Um, it usually does isn't centered quite as much around visuals as our pieces are. We pub but we publish very particular images in connection with each of the articles that we publish, partially because I know that when articles go out into the world these days, they're often shared on Twitter or Facebook or um, you know, various other platforms where an image becomes uh, almost a, a peg that the article becomes hung on. And so it becomes really important for helping it spread and helping it, helping it generate not page views, because we're not interested in clicks, uh, what we're interested in conversation, but in order to create conversation, it has to reach people. Um, so let me jump back into the slides. Um, I'm not. I'm pretty close to done with the slides, and then we can just open it up to full-on conversation. But there's a couple other examples I want to show here. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about our peer review process. Um, in our efforts at scholarly publishing, I would argue for the. This is again a restatement of my thesis, um, and I'm pretty certain now that this is my thesis. I would argue for the exact opposite of objectivity for an intense subjectivity, not just open peer review but a collaborative peer review where works are read and produced by and for a community of scholars. So when I talk about open peer review, I don't just mean that when you are peer reviewed on our journal, you know who the people who are peer reviewing your work are. This is true. We, are, we have never published anything blind. Um, it's not to say that I'm completely opposed to blind peer review, but we decided very early on in conversation with our audience that we would have open peer review. So when you publish something with us, you are in direct conversation with the reviewers that you're working with. Um, but it isn't just that. It isn't just that you know who they are. Adding this word collaborative, it's that your work is actually germinating in conversation with those, with those people. So essentially, our collaborative peer review process involves editors engaging directly with authors to revise and develop articles. Editorial work is done both asynchronously and synchronously in a Google Doc that evolves through an open dialogue between author and editors. It often also involves um, Google, uh, Google Hangouts or Skype conversations just like this one, so that you're not just getting feedback or getting track changes in a Word document. What you're actually getting is a conversation in the margins of your work that helps that work evolve and develop. It often means that works change very significantly from when they're first submitted to by the time that they're finally published. Interestingly, even though they change a lot from when they're, when they're submitted to when they're published, the process is often extremely fast. And the process is extremely fast because you're working directly and in conversation between editors and author. There's no sort of gap of having it having the piece submitted and then it has to go through me and sent out blind to reviewers, then I have to get those blind reviews, and then I have to synthesize, send them back to the author. There are a lot fewer um, exchange, there are a lot fewer of those um, pass off pass offs. Um, instead, there's a really lively conversation that happens in a Google document that helps the work evolve. And sometimes if, if someone says, oh, I don't know if my piece is there yet. I don't know if it's quite ready to be submitted. I'll often say, well, submit it now. Submit a relatively rough draft because sometimes that conversation can actually bring something to a final draft better. Someone 
submit something that's perfect, it's really hard for us to work with it because they're already so kind of um, attached, attached to their words and language that they're not really willing to have the dialogue that will help it evolve. Another thing that goes along with this notion of collaborative peer review is that we've chosen to include the um, reviewers, the names of every piece that we publish. Um, we also publish some non-peer reviewed pieces. So we do some republications, we do some announcements, we have some columns that are not peer reviewed. They usually only have a single editor. Um, our peer reviewed pieces always have um, three editors. They have two peer reviewers who are working directly with the author in the document, and then they have a third person who's a production reviewer, who's essentially doing the small things to get it ready for publication. Um, the two reviewers that are working directly with the person in the document are listed on the page when the, when the piece is published. So you have a byline up at the top, but at the bottom, it mentions that the piece is peer reviewed, has a link to a description of our peer review process, and then includes the people's names. Uh, because there's a really important thing that if this process is going to be so um, idiosyncratic, so um, such a dialogue, so collaborative, we really want to give credit to the reviewers who worked with the person on the piece. We want their names to be there. Um, so it, it becomes a kind of acknowledgement that it's a sort of complex byline. I'm actually going to skip this one um, and go to this one here. It says hybrid pedagogy is less focused on publishing articles as content repositories and more on reimagining scholarship as pedagogical, publishing as a way to create conversations and reach academic and non-academic communities. And there's a way that our um, collaborative peer review process really enables this by this conversation starts in the Google document between the author and the two reviewers, and then that conversation expands once the piece gets published. And what's interesting is those reviewers who review the piece in the Google document have a different sort of investment in the conversation that gets created once the piece is published. Their names are on it, but they've also been a part of this really dynamic conversation prior to the piece getting published. So what you end up with is this, commu this small community of three gets published on the journal, and then we also have post-publication peer, uh, post peer review in the sense that we have a robust conversation that happens on Twitter around our pieces usually, and then we also have the comment section on the document, the, the publication itself. Um, let me pause there and just see if there are any other questions. The last thing I'm going to do here is just talk about three of our calls for papers um, as, a, as another final example, and then I'll open it up for discussion. Any questions about our peer review process before I move on? It, a lot of it, the differences seem that what you're doing is you're actually engaging synchronously with the individuals. You're actually talking to them and engaging with them, and that allows for a conversation where traditional peer review, there's, there is no conversation, there's significant time delay, and what I at least know from my own experience in terms of writing and getting immediate feedback, it's much easier to evolve and grow a piece when you're in the midst of it and when you're writing it, as opposed to you write it, you set it aside, you may get feedback three or six months later, well, that's not the same you that was writing, you know, it's that kind of delay is, yeah. So I'm wondering if, was this synchronous versus asynchronous intentional or did it just kind of evolve or did it just seem to work pretty well? Um, it was definitely intentional. Um, essentially the word that I like is the word rapport, that I want there to feel like there's a rapport between the editors and the author, a rapport that essentially if you think about the kind of rapid fire exchange that we have in conversation and how productive that can be and how scholarly it can be, that kind of rapid fire conversation that sort of pushes our work in a way that the, del the time delay, it ends up feeling like pure feedback as opposed to conversation or rapport. Um, we actually started when we first launched, um, when we so when we first launched, our pieces weren't peer reviewed because we didn't have a review board. So at the beginning, it was a lot of me publishing and my collaborator publishing and us getting our friends to publish. It actually looked a lot more like a blog at the beginning partly because we were, we were literally forming the journal in front of everyone. Um, we've actually maintained some of that blogginess that it had at the beginning. We've essentially kept the best parts of a blog 
and then combined it with what we saw as the best parts of a scholarly journal, and that's what we end up having today, is something that really feels like a hybrid of what's sort of the best of both of those worlds. Um, at the, when we first started our peer review process after, that was about uh, by April, we had, in, we had put our peer review process into place. Um, and that was after a bunch of different conversations in a forum that we had for discussing what it might look like. So by April of 2012, we started the peer review process and at the beginning, every single peer review process had a synchronous video chat with the author, between the author and the um, reviewers. So at the beginning, it was that, uh, that notion of synchronicity that was really key. Um, so we ultimately discovered that there was enough of a feeling of synchronicity just in Google Docs that we currently don't require there always to be a synchronous video chat. But for the first, I think, eight months, every single piece published had comments in the Google Doc as well as a synchronous video chat. Now we've discovered that um, Google Docs feels synchronous. Even without the synchronous video chat, it feels synchronous enough. Because if I put a comment on your Google Doc, you get a little email ping that says there's a new comment on your Google Doc. You jump in and you respond to that little ping. Um, usually people do that within half a day. And so there's a feeling that it might not be synch like live, but it's at least things, exchanges that are happening over the course of a single day. Which is interesting because the work changes because it isn't just submit, get some feedback, make some changes, submit again, get some more feedback. If you think about most back and forths, there's about two back and forths. I think in our review process, we probably have 70 back and forths on the average piece because it's happening in that way. And it, it means that you can be working on the piece in such a more, um, at such a more micro, micro level where you're literally having engagement and dialogue around a single sentence. As someone who's done both traditional peer review, traditional blind peer review as an editor, as a reviewer, and as a writer, and someone who's done the process that we have at Hybrid Pedagogy, you think, well, gosh, wow, 70 exchanges? That feels so time consuming. I would ultimately say that we have a really hands-on, high-touch process that is actually less time consuming than traditional peer review. Um, and it's surprising that we get so much done and have such an intimate conversation about the work without having to spend a ton of time on it. These are two of the CFPs that we've done. So one of the ways that we, we have rolling publications, so someone can submit something at any point on any topic, but we also do CFPs pretty regularly. And the, the sort of reason for doing these CFPs is because then we have several articles on the same topic being published over a period of time that helps create more conversation because those authors can be in dialogue with each other and then those authors can also um, create a larger conversation than just the single pieces that they publish. This also gives us the opportunity to kind of pair people with one another in the editorial process because they're often working on similar topics. Um, so this is a CFP that we did on pedagogical alterity. And a, a brief quote from the CFP, as critical pedagogues we are aware that our rights and privileges are not valid unless we fight for the same rights and privileges for others. And so our journal has always illuminated the struggles of the outcast, the orphans, the contingent, those voices that go otherwise unheard of by the staid and layered pages of the everyday academic journal. Uh, so I mean, there, what, sort of what, I'm tr what we're trying to get across there is this idea that the work of editing, that the work of peer reviewing, that the work of a journal editor is not necessarily the work of the gatekeeper, that instead it's the work of the advocate. How can I best advocate for the writers? How can I best put them with reviewers that are going to help their work? This doesn't mean that we accept every single thing that we get. Because by advocate, sometimes the kindest thing you can do to a person is tell them that their work isn't ready. Most of our pieces these days, we have pieces that are read by a thousand people in their first day. We're getting a thousand unique visitors to the site. Every article at these, this point, even the less well-read articles, is being read by hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of people. So there's a way in which advocating and telling someone your work isn't quite ready yet be, isn't about gatekeeping. It's actually about care for that for that author. Um, so this is another CFP we did on the problem of contingency. 
The goal of this series will be to examine our role as pedagogues in a system wherein education does not always result in opportunity. We'll look at our complicity in adjunct labor practices, whether we are tenure track, part-time, contingent, or alt act and whether there's pedagogical value in making explicit for students how their college experience is and will be shaped by an increasingly bleak job market. This one actually sort of feels like it needs a dun 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 after it, uh, because it is a little bleak. What was interesting is we got a mixture of pieces for that that were both really taking this issue to task, and also um, we got some surprisingly optimistic takes on this and sort of ways to move forward. The reason that I wanted to talk about this one is I really wanted to talk, another one of our CFPs was for K through 12 educators. And one thing that we've done is we publish shorter pieces. So the average scholarly article is between, often between 3,000 and 8,000 words. Our average article is more in the range of 1,500 to 2,500 words. Partly, that is how you create a conversation. You don't create a conversation by you know, lecturing for lecturing for an hour like I'm doing and then asking people to talk at the end. You create a conversation by coming in right from the start with shorter things to say and leaving get more gaps for conversation. The other thing is contingent laborers, K through 12 educators, um, instructional technologists, staff members at universities don't often have the time that they need to commit to writing a piece that's between 3,000 and 8,000 words, writing a really polished piece of that length. And so having shorter pieces allows us to have more voices in the conversation. The last bit here um, to answer your question is we've just um, issued a call for editors. Up until this point, primarily all of our editors have been people who had written for us before. So they wrote for us, they experienced our process, and then we would ask them to be editors. Um, so they were invested already in the work of the journal. We decided to move away from that and do a call for editors because what we realized, what we started to realize is that there are some people who are strong editors but don't necessarily want to write for the journal. There are people who want to be involved in the work we do but aren't writers, that that's not the work that they do in the world. And so what we realized is we wanted to open up a space for um, people to participate just as editors in the journal. So if you, you can find this um, call and read the entire thing by just Googling hybrid pedagogy call for editors. But this is um, Sean Michael Morris, who is my co-director on the project now. He wrote in this call, my iron determination to, uh, is to offer authors public, my iron determination to offer authors publication is dogged. I prowl the gates of this journal, I do, but to keep them open, not closed, to invite them in rather than keep them out. So to answer your question, it's hard to find editors because editors in higher education, peer reviewers in higher education are very, very well trained by the blind peer review system. They're very, very well trained to be gatekeepers. And they're not trained as well to be advocates. So I mean, the question is, how do we find more editors? Hopefully this call for editors, which has gotten a huge response. I think we have 50 submissions um, to this call for editors. So hopefully this, this call for editors will help create a space where we can do more work in bringing people together that want to um, work on the project of editing for the journal. For me, the reward is, and those are the, that's the end of the slide. The last one that I just put up is just the address for the journal, which is easyhybridpedagogy.com. But um, I think that the reward is, the first and foremost reward, the reason that I run hybrid pedagogy, I feel like I've run two, I, I don't get any money for running hybrid pedagogy. We are a, we are a nonprofit, um, but nobody, nobody is paid for their work on hybrid pedagogy. I certainly am not paid, so I do it all voluntary. Um, it does influence and affect my scholarly work. The, thing, the reason I do it is I do it because it's a community. It's a community that I want to be a part of. It's a community that's having a conversation that I want to be in the midst of. So that's the sort of intrinsic value. The extrinsic value is that hopefully, yes, having your name as a reviewer and editor, being a part of our editorial board becomes a credit becomes a line in your CV, becomes something you can talk about in a job application letter. I think there's a bit of a delay. There's a bit of a delay because it takes a while for this work to be recognized as counting. But I mean, essentially, giving talks like this one that I'm giving today is the way that I advocate for my editors. Now I sort of feel like my role has moved from advocating for my writers, um, which is what I did for you know many years that I ran the journal. I was very hands-on on the process.
I've sort of stepped out and now what I see my role as is more advocating for my editors, advocating for their work counting, their work having value, their work, you know, doing work in the world, if you will. Um, and so I think that there's, in, in some ways, some days I feel like it's, you know, yeah, of course it counts. Other days I feel like, you know, there are institutions that say really clearly that this work doesn't count. There are institutions, there are institutions that will say that won't count the work that we do as peer reviewed because it's not because it's not blind peer reviewed. There are work that there are people who won't count this work because it's not in a print journal. Um, and so I think that it's a, essentially it's about talking about why it has value and making an argument for why it has value, both me and also the the editors and writers for the journal. So hopefully that kind of answers your question. It, it means hey, we need a street team to go, go around and say this has value. Have you had many submissions come from undergraduates to the journal? Um, not really that weren't um, solicited to a certain extent, not to, this, not to the point where I went out and said, hey, undergraduate, write, a, you know, write something for us. But essentially, we've done a lot of work and a lot of networking, if you will, to help bring more student writers into the journal. And honestly, we haven't had enough. The most success that we've had at getting um, undergraduate submissions has been when their teacher engaged them in a, pro pro a project that had them either writing for hybrid pedagogy or engaging with hybrid pedagogy in some significant way that then led to them submitting something. Um, we did have a book, our publishing division published a book that was all an edited collection that was about MOOC ex experiences in MOOCs. And all of the pieces for that collection were all written by students. We've also had several submissions by students, but in, in most cases, they're non-traditional students who are um, not conventional 20-year-old undergrad students. We'd like to see more. One of the challenges for me is, is you want to have a conversation that brings together students and teachers and administrators and technologists into the same room. But there's a way in which not necessarily all of those parties feel like they're welcome in the conversation. And I actually have to, I have to um, push on myself in the language that I use to not create a conversation that excludes them. For example, it's as simple as a word like pedagogy. A word like pedagogy doesn't necessarily resonate to an undergraduate student. Um, and in fact, it can feel alienating to those undergraduate students. And I've had undergraduate students that I've asked about the journal what they you know what they think of the journal and they've said quite clearly that they find that alienating so for me it's not necessarily that we have to run and change the name of the journal but it means we have work to do we have work to do carving out a space that feels hospitable to undergraduate students i'm kind of a, I'm a statistical analysis junkie um i love numbers i love data um and we have looked at the day i have looked at the data pretty closely myself my sense is that it's primarily a um, higher education audience. Um, I don't have demographic data where I, I actually know exactly where they came from, but I have other metrics and markers that give me a sense for who it is. And I would say that our audience is probably 80% higher education educators. We have a good, we've tried, we've worked really hard to create more content, more resources, more conversations that engage the K through 12 audience. And I feel like we've, we've had a lot of success and that we probably have at least 15% of our audience as um, K through 12. And I would say that the rest is made up of lifelong learners. We have a good kind of, we have a good group of networked learning people who aren't necessarily, they're, they're both educators and also um, lifelong learners who, in, who are engaged in network learning, who are engaged in MOOCs and engaged in, in uh, you know, open educational resources, um, those communities. But I would say yes, that it's primarily higher ed. And my sort of, sort of mission one for the journal at this point is expanding beyond just that insular conversation. To me, I mean, what I think that the key is just saying that we're open to the conversation and continuing to work and not giving up. Because honestly, we had a Twitter chat, for example, that was fo focused on students. And we had about 10 students join that conversation. It was about 10 students and about 40 educators, which wasn't really what we were trying to, that was not what we were trying for. But on the other hand, I felt like that was a success because 10 students engaged in a conversation about their own education, that will always be a success, even if it's just one.
Have you had many publications that have been, say, co-authored by graduate students and faculty or other faculty working together? I'm just wondering if that might be, because it seems like the process which you have is very conversation, as you said, rapport, mentor driven. I'm wondering if that might also be a way to maybe increase student responses or student participation, undergrad or grad, where it's co-authored pieces and or, because yeah. I believe there are several pieces already where the authors have included student feedback from their courses and their comments, but I'm wondering more if there was like direct narrative or voices in conversation about the experience of the course. I'm just trying to think out loud. No, I think that that's a super good suggestion. We have had that, and it's a good suggestion because we have we we have we publish a lot of collaboratively authored pieces. That was another thing that was really important to us from the beginning, and part part of the reason that we got a lot of those is we just modeled it ourselves. Um, when I publish for the journal now. 90% of the time, it's a co-authored piece. Um, we're also almost all of our announcements, calls for papers, almost all of those things have a byline, and usually it's a byline that has four people on it that all collaboratively authored the calls for call for papers or you know um, announcement that we wrote. And um, so we've been really successful at getting collaborative, collaboratively authored pieces. And there have been quite a few that were a teacher that was working with their student. I actually recently, my longest, my longest term mentor, who I have worked with for 16 years, um, R.L. Widman, she wrote a piece and she had one of her former students who was an undergraduate student who had just gotten tenure, who had, she had taught something like 30 years ago. She co-authored the piece with him, which is just a really lovely, a lovely thing to see people working across that kind of distinction. Um, the one thing that I don't think that we do is I don't think that we encourage collaboratively authored pieces on our like about us page and that sort of thing. And I think that that might be, there might be a paragraph in order, a three sentence paragraph that talks about collaboratively authored and also then talks about the specific kind of collaborations that might be valuable. The one that we have gotten quite a few times is um, a teacher or a pedagogue who is co-authoring with an instructional technologist. Because essentially, their course was created in conversation with an instructional designer. And I really, really appreciated the fact that they wanted to bring in their instructional designer as a co-author on the piece. Because so often the work of instructional designers is invisible and they're not thought of as full collaborators in the work of teaching and learning, when in fact they are. And we need more and more of that, those collaborations to be visible. We don't actually get a ton of comments on the pieces because what's happened is that the conversations are often happening on social media. It's interesting the way that comment spaces on, um, you know, on blogs and on journals like ours that have a comment space. I see fewer and fewer people using those comment spaces because often the conversation is happening on Twitter or it's happening on Facebook around the pieces. But there's still nevertheless often a conversation that's ongoing about the stuff that we publish. A couple other choices that I think influence that, having rolling publication, so not having issues. It means that essentially we get more readers because there's always something new for them to find on the journal. We publish anywhere between one and three things a week. We're not publishing three peer-reviewed articles per week, but we'll publish an announcement, an announcement of a digped conversation, a call for papers, we'll do a republication. Um, but we, uh, we tend to have, I think, about one peer-reviewed publication per week on average. Um, and that, but then we sort of fill it in with other things. So it means that it's lively. It's a space that stuff is happening, and so people want to return to it. The other thing is I think the choice to make the articles shorter um, encouraged more readership because they're not 3,000 to 8,000 word pieces. They're shorter, they're more bite-sized. To me, that's not about, um, it's not about having them be more superficial um, or less um, nuanced. Instead, it's about can you if you if someone sends me a piece that's eight thousand words. Generally, what I say is, can you think about a way that this is actually broken up into a three-part series, so that essentially you're creating those gaps for people to have a conversation, and then I know people are you're going to get more readers for a fifteen hundred word to twenty five hundred word piece than you're going to get for an eight thousand word piece. Um, the other thing that I would say is the pictures. Having the pictures there um, helps. The other thing is, um, that, you know, it's a bit of a controversial choice that I made early on 
to not have bibliographies on hybrid pedagogy, and it's actually meant a kind of uphill battle in trying to get it listed in the directory of open access journals, which it is now. It took me two years to get it listed. Um, also getting it listed in Google Scholar took me a good length of time because we don't have on the page bibliographies. We have links, every, um, every citation is a link. Um, all of those, and we're, we're working on making more robust metadata in the links so that there's the, essentially the equivalent of a bibliography inside the link itself. Um, but that choice to not have bibliographies means that when people look at the journal, they feel like they're looking at something different. Um, the, the reason that I did it is because where's a bibliography? It's right at the bottom. What's right below that on the page? The comment section. If you get to the bottom of the article and you hit, you're reading along and you hit a bibliography, you, you're stopped by that. Most readers are stopped by that and they click away. And so I decided if you take this away, what's right at the bottom of the article? Well, the icon to share it on Twitter and share it on Facebook and the conversation that's being had about it. Um, it's not necessarily that I want to murder bibliographies, it's just that they didn't make sense the form format we were publishing these pieces in. And plus I, also, I often think that the hyperlink is a more successful bibliography because rather than just being a list of what you referenced, it's actually an active link right to the piece itself. So it puts your work in conversation one link away from the original um, so that they kind of are brushing up against one another. And it also means that then there's a track back that's sent to that original source that they get a little ping often that says someone has cited you over on this website. And that often encourages people to come look at the citation that was made on that website, which is something that a conventional bibliography doesn't, doesn't actually succeed at doing. We say find something that you could link to where there's a stable reference to that thing that you're linking to. So it could be something like Google Books page. Um, it could be something like if there's a Wikipedia, like Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed, we might just link to the Wikipedia page. So something that we suspect will be a stable reference that someone can click on and then see the work. The danger in doing all of this is that your hyperlinks break. But honestly, citations inside of a bibliography also break. They break because the book is no longer in print and therefore that bibliographic reference becomes essentially use, useless. So there are some drawbacks to using the hyperlink as a as a citation method, but there are also some things that you some things that you gain from doing it. We've got three minutes left, so I have the final question for. So since your institution does not recognize all of that work, what do you do in order to meet that mm -hmm. that requirement of the hard copy, double peer blind review, et cetera? How do yeah. you how do you address that? Um, by being an insomniac and a workaholic, I suppose that's my first that's my first answer. And but I don't recommend that to everyone. But the truth is that I, I I used to kind of do double the work. I used to essentially just do traditional blind peer review publications myself, in addition to the work that I'm doing on hybrid pedagogy and the work that I'm doing for other open access um, journals. But more and more, I've gotten to this place where I think that at some point, the buck has to stop with someone, and someone has to be willing to put their tenure on the line. And essentially, that's, that's where I'm at currently. And I'm at the place where I have decided that I'm invested in this work, and I'm invested in this kind of work, and I'm essentially willing to put my tenure on the line. So there's a chance that I won't get tenure at UW-Madison because of these choices, but I actually think it's more valuable for me to um, take the risk because then what happens is if I do get tenure at UW-Madison or wherever I might get tenure, if I do get tenure, it basically says this work has value. If I do double the work and I do traditional stuff and this work, any committee can just look at this, this and say, oh, look, he does everything else. So we'll just give him credit for this and we'll, we'll excuse him for doing this work. But I think what we have to essentially say is that you don't have to do double the work. You can be this scholar um, and that, that, that that's valuable. And I think that the problem when you start, I mean, to get back to social justice, the problem that when you talk about having people do double the work is who gets excluded from that? Who can't do double the work? I can do double the work. I'm an insomniac and a workaholic. But someone that is a single mother who has a small child, can they do double the work?
can someone who is a uh, you know can someone who is not making a living wage and has to take extra work in order to succeed can they can they do double the work can an adjunct laborer who has to do nine classes and is praying for a tenure track job offer can they do double the work and the answer is that some of them can some of them kill themselves in order to do double the work and to get a tenure track job offer or tenure Great. Thank right. you so much. That was Thank great fun. I'm glad to chat with all of you. All right. Thank you so much.